Hitler is dead. The Nazi Hydra has been slain. Victory in Europe has been achieved. But the war is far from over. The war in the Pacific is still raging. In the Pacific Theater of Operations, the PTO, as opposed to the European Theater of Operations, the ETO, there are a series of axes of allied action and attack. And I don't think I want to use orange for the allies. Uh, I will instead use a bright blue. First off, the Japanese had advanced from French Indochina through Siam, today's Thailand, through Burma, which is part of British India, into India proper in a place called Assam, near a, a city called Impal. So the Japanese are invading through Southeast Asia, through the jungles. And this is a nasty theater of operations that usually comes last on everyone's priorities in the Allied sphere. The Japanese had also gone from tai uh, Taiwan through the American Philippines to the Dutch East Indies. That's one axis of attack. And into the uh, rest of the Dutch East Indies down here. The Japanese are, of course, deep inside China. Throughout most, most of the uh, coastal regions. And, of course, into French Indochina and out to India. So the Japanese control all of this territory north of Australia, except for the Port Moresby region of Papua New Guinea. They control most of the Solomon Islands, except for Guadalcanal. And they control much of the Pacific as well. So this is a vast empire ruled from Tokyo. And the Allies, in the Turning Point Battles of 1942, managed to stop them. At the Battle of Midway, the American carrier forces sank four of the six major Japanese fleet carriers, sealing the doom of Japan to quickly and easily win the war through conquest. At the Battle of Guadalcanal, the American equivalent of Stalingrad on a much smaller scale, there is a six-month grinding campaign from August, September 1942 until January, February 1943. But in a series of naval and air and land battles, uh, the Japanese are driven off Guadalcanal, and the stage is set for an Allied counterattack. Now, the reason that the uh, Japanese no longer have a chance of winning World War II, and this is some, something that they are quite aware of, is the way they view and train and assign aircraft carrier pilots. The Pacific War is not about battleships. It's not about cruisers or destroyers. It's about aircraft carriers. The main battery of these ships are planes and their pilots. Americans view pilots as professionals, and they train them as professionals into a common uh, standard of excellence, and they basically swap out fighters into different carriers. They swap out squadrons, squadrons come, squadrons go. The peacetime practice of assigning permanent squadrons to each carrier won't work anymore because those squadrons will get chewed up and exhausted. So the American system is to allow one-third of the time to be in rest and recovery, 
uh, one third of the time to be in training and getting ready for battle, and one third of the time to be in battle, and then you go back to training again. The Japanese, on the other hand, view carrier pilots as modern-day samurai, and these modern-day samurai start training uh, at the time Harry, like Harry Potter goes to Hogwarts. And that is a long training process that cannot be mass-produced. At least the Japanese don't find a way to mass-produce it, with the result being that the uh, Japanese carriers, even though new carriers are coming to replace the old ones, do not have the kind of experienced pilots that are going to make effective air groups. Without effective air groups, aircraft carriers are just big, flat, top targets. So, there is going to be an Allied drive back through Burma towards Siam, and this drive is going to be headed by British General Slim, as well as a bunch of special forces units that become really good at jungle fighting, the Chindits, uh, Merrill's Marauders, and so forth. In French Indochina, we've teamed up with a communist named Ho Chi Minh to help drive the Japanese out and we teach Ho Chi Minh and his Viet Minh how to uh, capitalize on Vietnamese natural skills at defending their homeland with guerrilla warfare. <laughs> Not that that's going to ever come and bite us in the backside. Uh, obviously, we are supporting nationalist Chinese movements to hold off the Japanese in China. But the main thrust of the Pacific War is going to be borne not by the British and not by the Chinese in terms of the definitive moves towards victory, but by the Americans. And the Americans are wealthy enough in their industrial prowess to do a number of things simultaneously, to walk and chew bubblegum at, at, at the same time. America had agreed to a Europe-first strategy. And what the British thought is that we just hold the line in the Pacific and wait until Europe is finished, and then we go after Japan. But the American Navy does not want to do that. Admiral King, the head of our Navy, wants an aggressive uh, attack through the Central Pacific, a bit like the old Naval Plan Orange, to go into the Marshall and the Gilbert Islands, take them, and then move up towards Japan to the Marianas, the Volcano Islands, and up. That's the naval plan, the Central Pacific Offensive. Boom, 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 and so forth. But General MacArthur, who has a unique stature in the United States, being the most decorated officer of the First World War, being the chief of staff who dispersed the bonus marchers with cavalry, being the field marshal, the first field marshal of an independent Filipino army, being also several times a serious Republican candidate for president, or at least a candidate for the Republican nomination for president. MacArthur has some pretty powerful political chops, and MacArthur has promised the Filipinos, I shall return. So MacArthur insists on an offensive from the southwestern Pacific up the Marshalls, I'm sorry, up the, uh, the Solomon Islands towards Rabaul, and also doing end-run attacks using Navy power around Japanese bases to nullify the Japanese occupation of New Guinea, as well as to isolate the Japanese outer capital of Rabaul. And from here, MacArthur then plans to go back to the Philippines. That is the southwest Pacific axis of advance. And the United States is wealthy enough to do a Europe first strategy, but also to have not one, but two major axis of advance, one headed by Navy aircraft carrier task groups, the other an island hopping campaign led by General MacArthur. 
and the Southwest Pacific, whose objective is the Philippines. Now, you might ask, why give MacArthur those things? Well, MacArthur wasn't just an American officer. He had been made Field Marshal of the Philippine Army. America had been giving the Philippines their independence. MacArthur made it clear to President Roosevelt that people around the world would look to see if Americans would bleed for yellow men, to see if Americans would die for Asian allies. Filipinos, the battling bastards of Bataan, had died for the red, white, and blue. Would we then do the same to free them? And Roosevelt agreed. In order to demonstrate that the United States was a strong ally not only to whites and Europeans, but to Asiatics as well, we would make the Philippines, taking the Philippines, a serious objective. So that is the approach, or those are the approaches taken. The British are, and uh, American Special Forces are going to hammer away in Southeast Asia. The fleet is going to come through the Central Pacific, and uh, MacArthur's army and navy will move through the eastern portion of the Dutch East Indies towards the Philippines. That's where we'll leave things until next time.